everybody. Welcome to Holy Foley. I'm Dr. Vanessa the Moment, and my guest today is Midge Costin, Professor of Cinematic Arts and the K. Rose Endowed Chair in the Art of Sound and Dialogue Editing at USC in Los Angeles, California. And yes, that is a mouthful. However, she is also an award-winning sound editor and the producer and director of the award-winning film, Making Waves. Welcome, Midge. It's good to see you. You, Vanessa. So I, gosh, I, I can't wait to get started. What I wanted to talk with you about straight away, since you're at USC, and since we both have been in the academic world and the professional world of film sound, is I wanted to get started talking about what you have seen being such uh, an important part of production film sound in the production filmmaking part of USC as the changes over the last five to 10 years in teaching film and film sound in the academic world at one of the bigger and more important film schools in the United States. So if we could start there, I'd really love to do that. And then we'll see where we go from there. Great, okay. So, um, well, I know, I mean, I've been teaching for, and I know you've been teaching a long time for like 30 years. And um, when I first came into USC, for example, they all of the the class descriptions were, um, visual, uh, visual storytelling and, you know, visual filmmaking. And it was like, and I said, can we add the word oral, you know, and I talked to my students all the time about cinematic, you know, the word cinematic and what it means. And it's like both picture and sound. And, um, um, but, you know, so I would say, you know, when, when you say that about what's, what are recent kind of within, you know, five or 10 years, it's really that I feel like I kind of teach and have the same approach, which is, um, you know, sound, we approach from story, which I think all departments do, all um, disciplines do when you're dealing with film or, and, um, but what I see is the students are more interested than some of the older faculty who are teaching, you know, that they, they're still like, I still have to like, kind of insert myself and um and 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 remind them how important sound is and that it's not just visual um but the students have real interest because i think you know why i think because they're watching on little screens and you know when i went around i went around the world with making waves the art of cinematic sound and people would say there were certain questions you know i'm sure you get asked too right but they always would say well what's some um, what about people not going to theaters and i would say all the it makes sound even more important the smaller the screen the more important sound is because it's bringing you the emotion that you might not see on someone's face or exactly. you know, and it's so emotional that sound is is even more important and um and okay so the other thing is we just had 32 sound screen it at USC I just talked to Sam Green and got brought haven't brought it in for the um documentary um uh, for a documentary class, but told all our sounds, um, you know, students in sound too in our classes. Um, and binaural, I think that that's so interesting because they are, everyone is watching on smaller screens, you know, and just thinking of that being a print master, you know, but, um, and one of the things that's changed is, you know, we used to do, I don't know, is this getting too techie? No, um, no, 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 this is great. I love it. <laughs> not, but, we, you know, we used to, we used to, always our first and second semester or second semester students, for example, would do um, a sound, they would do a two track, you know, so it would be a two track that could be, it was a LTRT, left total, right total, which could then um, be decoded into a LCR, left, center, right, and surround. But now we do a true um, stereo, L-O-R-O, left only, right only, because no one's doing the LTRT anymore, but the cl next classes up are doing, they want to start um, um, Atmos. <laughs> it's like, oh my God, you know, teaching Atmos like at school, film school seems, you know, almost crazy to me, but I think it's because that's what's, you know, everyone's doing. So, you know, Atmos with all at what, 63 or four or something speakers, it's like, it's crazy. Um, but I think it's because the students are, are more interested and younger filmmakers realize how important it is, you know. Now, the other thing is, 
that there's more of a combination of like we were in a kind of a program that was mostly for motion picture sound sound right and so it was for the theater and now i find that all the students are are um collaborating more animation wow. vr you know so virtual reality games and interactive and they don't see a difference so much you know and they just you just have to figure out same way we did you know when we went like from film to digital and we all thought oh no are they going to replace us with you know these young bucks and then it was of course at least the studios and producers and whatever realized no we were the we were the the artists who knew how to use sound and so right, you that it wasn't learn. about the tools it was really about the craft exactly it's always right. about yeah the Although art in the beginning they thought it was about the tools and then they realized they were wrong yeah in the very and beginning in the early 90s they started thinking oh we can just have some guy in his garage with the Pro Tools do this. And then they realized that wasn't working so well. <laughs> well, I think it's really interesting too, because that's it's happening in AI. Some people, oh, we're, everyone's going to be replaced. And it's like, um, yeah, not really. Yeah. The, when it comes to art, but, you know, maybe, maybe these, these, the AI will figure out, you know, if it gets enough. It'll um, never, it'll never have the empathy and the emotion and the ability to see something very specific and situational. It'll never be able to, re you know, and, and I'm just going to take a quick diversion about this because it's kind of like the self-driving cars. Self-driving cars only know what the car it's in is doing, but it can't anticipate what the other cars are going to do. That's the problem with self-driving car. So there's always a limitation to what something that is not human can actually anticipate or do. I, I, I want to bring in something that I have, that I experience every single year. I judge the internships um, for the Television Academy every year, and I have been since the 90s, early 90s. Yep. And it's something that I really love doing. I love, and I, I do various categories because I have expertise in more than just sound. I'm in a lot of song, a lot of musician um, programs because I'm in the composers and lyricists and I'm in BMI, I'm a songwriter and a composer and I'm also in equity and SAG. So I know a lot about acting and and um, picture editing. And so, because I've been in the editor's guild. And so I, I judge a lot of different categories depending on what they need. And um, I noticed something really interesting, Mitch, and I'd really love to hear your opinion on this because I get, I have the opportunity to judge um, from schools all over the country. And actually, it's really interesting. The same schools have the same issues all the time, and the same schools have the same quality all the time. Here's what I discover, and I, I find it very frustrating. When the category is picture editing or composing or dramatic writing, which is another thing because I'm also in the dramatist guild, I, I'm a playwright and I have a theater degree. Um, and I know a lot about writing. So there are areas where I have skills and expertise and I put myself out there because I know they need people to do this. The area, the area of expertise in these areas is phenomenally strong, especially in music composition or picture editing or writing. And it's vast all over the country. And there will be really remarkable faculty and I will be really amazed, specifically, particularly in writing and music from all over the country. I am sad to say that even when Dave Stone and I left to go start teaching in 2004, when we left to go to DePaul in Chicago and start help them start their film program with him teaching sound editing and I was teaching sound editing Foley ADR and working with actors right um it isn't much better now no the dearth of programs that actually teach sound I know not much different yeah and the very same schools that had good programs are the same schools 20 years later and they don't even require samples of sound editing or sound mixing and it is so sad that i will get somebody applying who the letter of recommendation will say 
this person has done some songwriting or this person helped me with some live recording or this person has some classes in music composition or the letter the professional letter cover letter will say i really like television and i really like sound and i look at these letters as opposed to the ones of the composers who have taken years of composition and i am a professional musician and i've written a musical about foley and i have been a professional musician since i was 17. so i'm looking at these musicians and they blow you out of the water or i look at the picture editing and i mean i can really tell the difference between someone who's just cutting images which is nothing or someone who really can do storytelling and knows shot reverse shot and knows how to put story together and knows how to do comic timing or knows how to put, do traumatic tension um, or someone who does storytelling and writing and knows how to build tension in the way they write and then I get to sound and it's the same five or six schools every year right and I and I wonder as I hear you talk because USC always has good candidates Chapman always has good candidates um, SCAD always has good candidates and I, I'm saddened that we are still fighting this fight of sound isn't playing a mu an instrument. Sound is not, it's, it's an essential, important part. And I cannot believe they are still not funding important, essential sound courses. And the other part is, and this is the other thing, because I post on Facebook what is going on here, and I hear back from faculty members at schools that I've taught at, well, the students, you know, and these internships pay fairly decently, but the student does have to get out there, and they do have to find a place to live, and they think this is an obstacle, and my point is, if you want to come to L.A. and work in L.A., you do have to make a sacrifice. You do have to actually put some skin in the game, and there's this attitude of, well, but that's hard. And it's like, yeah, if you want to come to Los Angeles and you want to learn from the very best in the world and they're willing to pay you a really like the best professional internship you'll get, you have to make a sacrifice. You have to make a commitment. So I'm wondering, what is it going to take for A, people to understand that we need real quality sound courses. And I was at, I was an endowed chair at a university that still only has two people teaching sound. And I was there and they no longer kept, they didn't keep me and they don't have an endowed chair. And I was teaching fully an ADR and sound history and courses they needed at that they no longer teach. And I'm thinking, I, I don't understand. What do they not get? What do you think they do not get? Yeah, I think, I mean, it was like when we were making um, making Waves, the, the movie, which I wanted to make forever because I felt the same. I feel like it's something about how we perceive that we, do, we are not aware of sound. We're not aware of sound. And so people making films, unless they're really, you know, um, Unless they're making it day in and day out, I feel like that they don't understand the importance of sound. I, I really think that it's that. I mean, they talk about editing being like the invisible art, but and, and I have to tell you the truth that when I like even for my students, first semester graduate students, they make these short movies that the first one's 30 seconds, the next two are like a minute, and then the last one is like four minutes. I they have to go up on they have to upload them at um on our drive at like midnight by the midnight i have to watch them vanessa before because if i just because sound well done fits the story so well and they're like this that it's hard to so i i watch them a couple times before i get into class and make my notes or otherwise i'd be like oh that was great or you know that didn't work. And then why? And it could very well be the sound. Unless it's like super, super great or it's super, super bad. <laughs> it's like, but 
you know, there's just, I think it's something about as human beings, how we perceive, but that's what I've been saying about, because even, I mean, I'm at USC, which is one of the places that we put a lot of energy, even when I, I was there in the eighties and there were three, there were just three departments that it was, um, cinematography, editing, and sound. And, but I feel like, you know, and now of course they've expanded uh, producing and directing and all this stuff, but you, I'm still, we still fight for like our equipment is probably the oldest, yeah, particularly our production, you know? And I feel like we're we're on the front lines, like always trying to fight for what we have. And yet, you know, we do have like um, great students, but you're also, you were talking about, and I don't know if this is going off topic. You were talking about being in LA. I just had the most amazing weekend. We went to um, CAS, it was C, you know, all the awards. CAS and MIPSI, which I'm way out in the desert and I didn't want to drive in. And last year I drove in and I spent the money and I was I was exhausted. And I thought, you know, I'm just not up to it this year. Yeah. But the, here's the thing is, we had two students who were up for CAS. None of them were up for MPSC, but, um, and they, Walter Murch was there because he was getting the ACE um, career achievement. So I introduced them all to, him to Ron Bartlett to Eileen Lee to mm -hmm. I mean all these people they got a thought everyone got a thousand dollars to my TA from last semester and my TA this semester both got my TA from this semester won and you know they they all got a thousand dollars she got a five thousand dollars and then they get these sought they got avid you know media composer and um pro tools and isotope and you know all these amazing things and you know, so it's like everybody should be applying. Students should be applying for these. And that's yeah. just, that's just a CAS. CAS, though, is wonderful. CAS has always been on the edge as far as really supporting students. I mean, it's just, it's a yeah. Cinema Audio Society is a tremendous organization. I have always been so thrilled. I'm an affiliate of it, of course, because I'm not a mixer. And I've always just loved CAS. I, I think mixers are just they're my favorites they're, I just love mixers so much well, one of the things that I always tell my students is join that like when I first speak to them is like I write down on the board all those organizations the CAS the MPSC ACE you know ASC because if they can get into student um this you know student version they'll be invited to panels and to screenings right. and to they get to meet people and people love to talk about their careers. I mean, Walter Murch was talking to our students and they were all like, they could barely speak. They were so like in yeah. awe. <laughs> it's like so cool. It's, it's, really, that, it's, it's yeah. so interesting that people think they want to hear about sound, but most of the time, what I find Mitch yeah. is when people want to talk about sound, they really only want to talk about the superficial parts of it. And they really don't want to talk about the theory and the philosophy and the depth and the storytelling and the real beauty and the aesthetics of it. They only want to talk about, well, what did you use for this? And how did you do that? And how did you get in? And how do I get a job? <clears throat> and they don't really want to talk about what is the absolute aesthetic beauty of the storytelling and and how it moves the picture. And, 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 and that's the part that really matters. And now Walter talks about that and other people talk about that. Um, a lot of people don't even understand Walter's perspective of the aesthetics of it. I do more because I was in the Bay Area for two years. I worked with people there, um, briefly talked with him, worked with Alan Splett, worked with people up there, know a lot about the way that Walter worked because I worked with people who worked with him. And I know his perspective on Foley because I did an in-depth study of English patient and worked with, talked with a lot of the people who worked on it so I know how he approaches Foley, which is very different than a lot of LA people would probably think because he's not a fan of the sterile Foley studio approach oh. at all. And yeah. and um, he's he's got a very different approach to so much of sound. And, you know, they, they think they know what he, it's amazing, it's amazing what people assume. But then a lot of people assume that Jack Foley was a sound editor and no, he was not. <laughs> sound editing did not exist when Jack Foley was doing what he did. There was no such thing as synchronized sound back in 1929. Um, and it's amazing to me that we are still trying to get people to understand that yeah. we, we heard in the wound before we saw anything. Right. We were making sense of the world from what we heard in the wound. So we yeah. were making 
a sense of what we heard, not what we saw. And I, I think that what is amazing to me is we still attach meaning by sound more than we even know. And we think we are attaching meaning by what we see. Yeah, I know. I the totally sound agree. actually creates, you know, Michel Chion makes this point over and over and over again. And um, when I was getting my PhD, I went to UCLA and I heard him speak. And um, I met him and of course his English was very broken and we've talked briefly. And, um, but he's the first one to say that we attach meaning by what we hear. Yeah. We attach meaning to picture from the sound attached to it in film. It, it, it evokes so much by what we attach meaning to. And yet we think that the picture is everything. And when you look at the, the way sound influences what it is we think we see, you would think finally film schools would get how important sound is. And I wanna go back to um, yeah. the school that I was the endowed chair at for five years, Ball State University, which had two people teaching sound, one from which was teaching um, field recording and, and, and one that was teaching mixing and re-recorded sound. And he's older and they offered him early retirement and he said no, and he wouldn't take it, but they actually were gonna get rid of one of the two people teaching sound. Yeah. And only keep the one that was teaching field recording um, because they're getting rid of everybody approaching a certain age. And they already had let me go and did not offer me one of the tenure lines that was still there because I was of a certain age and they were getting rid of and they're changing things and short sightedness. And what can I say? Moving on. And he said, no, I will die here. And he's also the voice of NPR in that particular school. But oh. they actually were going to let go of the person that was teaching the mixing and editing courses. And he and I worked very closely together when I was there. We co-taught a lot and did a lot together. The short-sightedness of people who do not really grok yeah. how this works. And they, I, I, I truly believe, Midge, that a lot of this is, and I, it's my rant about technology, this idea that technology replaces the art and that if the students have the tools, they'll figure it out and they won't need the artisans to explain to them how you make meaning. And I'm gonna bring this back to what Dave Stone is doing right now, because you may not be aware of it. He has a website called The Sound of a Shot. And it's something he's put up, which is putting up his philosophy it was what he was teaching at SCAD. So he was at Savannah College of Art and Design and his approach to, and here's an Academy Award winning sound editor for Dracula who was as good or better at every piece of sound editing as anyone could be. And we both know that. We both know how great Dave was. And he's gone back to te doing a website on mon monoral sound, old film, and getting students and people and fans to look at sound simply with monoral, monoral sound to start, start to look at how story is taught, how story relies on sound by looking at it simply. So he's doing black and white early film with, with monoral sound so that people can understand how important sound is to the story before the bells and whistles. Right. Because as much as this man and I both made our nut during big sound. Both of us became the A-list in big sound. We both understood that it was the dialogue film where sound was actually the most important. And so he has gone back to his website, Sound of a Shot, which he's designed. And it's all about <clears throat> understanding the simplicity and the importance of the small sound. And it's, the storytelling and the way sound evokes emotion and storytelling that we forget. And so this addiction to tools and tech has, I think, caused everybody to forget. They think if students have the tech, they don't need to understand the storytelling and the emotion that sound actually is about, which if you go back to the very beginning with 
some of the scholars like Rick Altman and Michelle Shion, and then what I try to write about when I'm writing everything I do, focusing on fully but performative film sound. And and um, there, in April, there's going to be a sound studies sound just studies design handbook come out where I write about Foley, focusing on what this is really all about. And it's right. what you're talking about. We yeah. can't just have people loose with the tools and think they're going to figure it out. It is all about how sound evokes the importance of the story. Right. Well, and one of the things that I emphasize, it's so interesting, I got to come back to, because I talked to Walter, and you know what Walter's doing? Walter's doing a movie now about how we did sound on movieolas and everything. So it was quite the interesting. What's it going to be called? I don't know. I forget. I don't know if he gave me it thing but it's so interesting because we went back to some films you know and now I forget who he said the director was but he was working with a big director and everything it's really crazy but here's the thing is that I totally agree with you Vanessa I spend so much time on getting them to get good sound and I just want to say something about tools a couple of years ago when Tarantino's when um Mark Yulano was up for um the hateful eight or something or that you know that was it you know they do the dog and pony show they do the panels and everything and right, I went right, to right. it somebody asked inevitably some guy some boy raises his hand what microphone did you use and he refused to say what the microphone was it's not about the microphone and that's what so here I spend so much time on having them understand the importance of good production sound right and because it's not necessarily, but it's, it's like, okay, that circle take is the performance. It's both the visual, but it's the oral. It's what they're saying. It's how they said it. And I always say too, it, the important thing might not be like when I interviewed Sophia Coppola, she said what interested her was what was between the words and the breath, how somebody breathes tells us more about how they feel than the words that they're saying. We don't yes. say necessarily what we feel or, you know, what we're even thinking or whatever. And, and But it's like, you hear somebody breathing, you you can tell I'm excited about this because of the way I'm breathing or holding my breath. And then, right. and just, so in and the then, blink of an eye and in the length of a breath. <laughs> And I love, and so I, I'll tell them, like, I will do anything to save that production. And then, you know, um, in, in Foley, the same thing. It's like, look, does it matter to the story? Do you need to right. get every step in? Or is it about the hands touching? You know what I mean? And, I and, yeah, and, and so it's like, I just, we just keep story, 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 story. And, um, and then, and it's the students who get that. And we don't get the most technical, you know, the techie necessarily. It's the people who get like, oh, the importance of, you know, this, this sound of the story. You know, it's funny too. Um, I, I get so humored with people who want to get involved with Foley and think that Foley is duplicating what you see is happening on screen. And so they'll do exactly what they see happening on screen. Like they see somebody doing push-ups on screen, so they do push-ups on screen, or they see, and they don't understand that that it's not about duplicating. It's about what is it you want to hear and what do you want it to sound like? And you don't need to do what's really happening. Yeah. And and that you need to decide what is it you want it to sound like and how does it fit in. And I think I, I recently talked to um a Foley artist in Spain who has has the most amazing Foley set stage stages. He's done the French perspective where he's got a bunch of different rooms set up. The French style is, which I love the way the French do it. They have different room setups in their room setups stages. They mm -hmm. have a room that's set up like a kitchen, a room that's set up like a bedroom, and a room that's set up like a living room, and a yeah, and a car, a room with a car that's got all the complements of a car. So the French aesthetic is to be able to recreate in a very naturalistic, impressionistic way. And he, um, because he's a European, he can travel to different countries, and he decided that he really liked the French aesthetic sensibility, which frankly I do too. I really love what the French do. And I've interviewed so many different Foley artists and sound people from all over the world. So I have a real sense of how the culture and their perspective of storytelling and their history affects the way they hear sound and the way they want to 
use it in the way they edit or the way that they do Foley or the way they mix. And I have a real appreciation for not being American centric in our storytelling. So he's adapted his film studio in Spain very much the way the French do. And it's a beautiful facility and it's lovely. And he also goes out and does location sound. Sometimes he wants to go outside because he wants to capture a sense of the outside. But he mm -hmm. started out as, a, as an editor, a sound editor. And I think what a lot of the times I get humored by is most Foley artists and all of them in the United States, save for me, because I was married to an editor. So I learned about editing and I learned about ADR and I led ADR groups and I did voices because I was an actor. And I was on a dub stage, so I learned more about mixing probably than any Foley artist in the United States because I was inquisitive. So I was on a dub stage and I did editing fixed edits on a dub stage and I did work with the mixers and I did work in ADR groups. And I, so I did all of these jobs. I don't think they even understand what happens in the final mix. I don't think they understand that it doesn't have to be the exact thing. I don't think they understand that it has to fit into production. I don't think they understand what a dialogue editor does. Yeah. And if you don't understand what a dialogue editor does, then you don't even understand what comes after that. And that the very first step is what does the dialogue editor do? And because I had been around Dave Stone and dialogue editors and watched with great interest these incredible dialogue editors and learned what they do, I went, oh, once you understand what a dialogue editor does, then you understand the entire process of what we do in post, because that's where it starts. What does yeah. the dialogue editor do? Right. I know people don't even know that there are dialogue editors. And when I teach the class, you know, I say, I'm going to teach you a classic way of dialogue editing that even the best filmmakers and a lot of times the best sound designers have no idea. No idea. No idea, right? And it's and it's going to save their butts, especially doing low budget or student films or whatever, you know. So I like I just sat yesterday with the guy. He thought he had to do. He was going to have to ADR the whole thing, and it was just simple, simple dialogue editing. I mean, I couldn't believe it. He was amazed, you know. And um, and it's so fun to teach him that. And then, but you know, you teach it, and then they think of. Oh, that's going into too much detail. And then, you know, they do little crossfades, you know, between different takes. And of course, every take sounds different, even ones on the stage that we had. Hardly ever can you, you know, and it's like, and then, and telling them too, like, we know this because of, we're working on old, on film, right? Right. When we, um, on magnetic film, where you couldn't see the waveforms. And it's like, we had to just listen. So I say, listen. Oh, well, gosh. Wait, Madge. Uh, wait, you mean listen? You mean actually listen? You know what I do is I'll take the picture and cover up the Pro Tools. And I always tell them, after you do a fix, don't look at it because your eye will, whatever you see, you'll hear it. Right. And you're going to make so much more work for yourself. So do the fix. And I always say to them, look at the picture. And then we just look at the picture. And it's like, if you, hey, if different takes work and you don't hear anything and you don't hear, you know, then great. And, you know what you, I always say? You know what I would always say when I was with beginning editors, when I was at Sony and I was supervising a film and the beginning editors were looking at the wave, I'd say, don't look at the wave, look at the picture, look at the Foley and see if it goes with the picture, because guess what the audience is going to be watching? They're going to be watching the picture. I, right. and, and it's like they get addicted to looking at the wave. And I say, who's the wave is only there if you when you edit. But after yeah. that, just look at the picture. Listen and look at the picture. The wave is just there for when you edit. You don't need it any other time. And we're so lucky now that we have it and everything. It makes everything so much easier and so great. But yeah, it's like, so it's like, you've just like, trust your ears. I always say, you know, let your ears tell the truth. Do you need to split the, you know, the takes? And um, if you hear something that, you know, takes you out of it or whatever. It's so fun to teach students it, because what we do is teach students to listen to listen well and you know i mean i've had students go out you know they'll they'll go out and record and come back and on field recordings they can't hear the wind blow, they can't hear the movement the mic movement with their you know and it makes that right. they don't hear 
because they're so they went out and they thought they recorded the f fountain so they're hearing the fountain and I said but hear that and they're like no what it's like the ch -ch -ch. and you have I have to like do it's crazy you know and um and, and but anyways it's really you know interesting to teach people to listen and um and production I think it all starts with dialogue editing and, and of course then they forget and they think this is the funniest like they don't get that it's all about you know people say Oh, oh, don't worry about it. I got room tone. It's like, you know, quiet for room tone. We don't use the room tone. We use the fill within the take. Right. And you don't get that basic principle. And it's funny because sometimes um, production mixers come and talk and, and, but they even know now that you don't need, you don't do, unless it's an unusual environment and they want to record it, but there's no reason to do room tone because you take it all from um, the, within the, yeah. And, and the other thing, the other thing that I've heard, I've heard students say, or really uneducated film teachers is, well, you're just going to clean it all. And it's like, no, you're going to match it. Yeah. You're going to actually dirty it up. You're going to match tapes so that when it goes from angle to angle, it's not going to sound different. It's going to sound like it's the same place. Yes. And the louder of uh, the, the fill is on a take, you know, the background sound is uh, on a take, the longer you have to make that tail out so you right. don't know or come in. And it's the antithesis of what they think. So that one of the funniest things that happened to me was a guy who thought he was really, who was really into sound and he was going to go into sound. And everything. Well, he was going to outsmart me on this after I did a whole, you know, do a whole lecture on dialogue thing. so then, so I and then everybody gets in this thing to do their do, do one of the scenes from their movie and it was downtown LA they recorded so what he did is he cut out all the fill between the dialogue and put clean fill in oh, and no. so in their mouths it's like Pandora's box and trucks come out cars come out you know people pedestrians everything come out of their mouth and he was listening to it and the other problem that students will do is They'll keep their head, they'll keep the headphones low because they don't want to hear the bad, the bad fill or whatever. And then you put it up in a, in a mix, like I would teach in a mix stage and then we put it up and there it is all on its own in that center speaker, nice, a nice speaker. And it's like, blah, 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 you know? and all of this traffic's coming out of the people's mouth. He was humiliated. <laughs> and so I tell my students about that it was really funny. But, you know, they'll try to do the long cross fades between different. Because um, I was around Dave so much, Dave Stone, who is, as we know, wonderful. I learned so much watching his precision with mm -hmm. not over cleaning and with matching. And he is one of the best. Yep. He, thought he was good at every kind of editing. He could do backgrounds, sound yep. effects, and dialogue. And he just was just he could do it all and so and because and he could cut foley of course because he wouldn't overcut you know don't overcut foley cut as little as don't overcut foley um otherwise it's going to be sterile so don't overcut foley so he just you know he started out in art school so he had a real sense and i learned so much about editing that when i started editing i felt really blessed to have somebody like that who was the person who taught me how not to overcut and how to cut as little as possible so that I ended up when I cut Foley or ADR, which were the two things I edited. Mm -hmm. I was good at both because I had somebody like him because he'd cut ADR, he'd cut everything. I learned mm -hmm. how not to overcut and how to do it. And so I ended up being really good at both cutting Foley and ADR because I had Dave Stone as the person who showed me how not to overdo. Yeah. And then what I would, and he'd say, you know how I know when somebody doesn't know how to cut Foley? This is when we did Mag. He'd say, when they take their reel back and put it in, up in the bin, I'll see how many tape marks are there. Mm -hmm. And if there are too many tape marks, I know they overcut. Yeah. He said, that's how I know they don't know how to cut it. Yeah. There shouldn't be a lot because it shouldn't come from this. It should be performed on the stage pretty much in sync, but just, and there shouldn't be, if there's too many tapes, there's too much tape, they've done too many splices. I know they've overcut it and we're going to have trouble on the stage. And I never forgot that. I never mm -hmm. forgot that. Don't overcut. 
-hmm. let it lie and only cut just watch the picture mm -hmm. and and I would I and when I had to start supervising other fully editors who by the time I was supervising you know when I when I was supervising and there were other editors cutting under me it was somebody like Salon she knew how to edit so I didn't have to worry about it but when it was other people on Pro Tool or it was Cyberframe at the beginning it was Waveframe I had to say, don't overcut, don't overcut. And they had been cutting dialogue. And I said, don't overcut, don't overcut. It was at Sony. But it's really interesting, this tendency they have to look at the waves and think that they need to be so precise. And it's like, the only time you do that is when you're getting rid of something you don't need. You've got to be careful. Um, so what are, so you, are you finding that the students are falling in love with the tools and wanting to do plugins or are you disabusing them of using plugins as well we i don't i we don't have them do anything for the first year and then we really have um the uh, you know we we try to do um try to do the real the real basics in the first year so it's all um uh so i'd rather have them not do it Although the first semester, it depends on how much experience they have. But what I always explain to them is that they're listening with headphones, and um, it sounds really different on a you know big speaker, even in our classrooms. So be careful of what you do. The first semester they have to, so they'll do the phone futs or the you know TV or small speakers or something, and so and they'll do the reverb and all that. The second semester they are going somebody a, a more advanced student will mix who's into sound who will be mixing their films. And so I tried to explain if you want to try something and really not um uh, plugins not not so many plugins i mean they they can do some basic things like you know if they want but i say always bring the original too so because you the reverb might not be right in the in a mix room might not sound the same as it sounded on headphones and um so the you know the only thing i really have them do is if they want to make like you know a creature vocal or do you know do something that's like an effect and I try to wait for them to wait, like for the mix stage. And then the the third semester students who kind of are more going into sound, um, we have edit rooms that, you know, sound editing rooms where, yeah, they can hear on speakers and um, are more like our, our, our small mix stage. So they're good for sound designing and, and even, you know, at um, the, you know, if they want to use isotope or something. So um, for dialogue editing. Um, but I just try to keep it really, you know, simple at first and just, just tell them it's all about the story, you know, and it's not so much about the tool. And it's also, you know, think of, think in terms of metaphor and, um, you know, really think about what you need. So I always, you know, start out with them, always say, have at least two backgrounds. And I think of it as mood and tone. It's like the music to every scene, but subtle. Mm -hmm. And I tell them. And they bring it in like just uh, right away. I would say just go negative twenty on some of them. Then you might have to bring them way up. But just like they're quiet, but they're going to set a tone. And then, um, and then really think about what you need. Where are the story points? Where are the plot points? So it's like the the slug line. You're going to think of what are my backgrounds? And then you know, effects wise, it's easy uh, for me. I always say, you know, I would start with what's on screen. And put those in, you know, the 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 hard effects, as we say, because it's hard sync. And then, but I say sometimes the most important and really difficult are the off-screen effects are going to give you those sometimes how somebody's feeling or what the reaction is, or because things don't have a plot point. Right. And you might not have a plot point, and it might be um, you know, something and it's like a like I'll say, like something happens embarrassing at the beach, your suit falls down. So but you know, skulls, you know, they go you know and, and crows can sound like that too or crows can sound evil so you know and it's that baby crying in the next room and there are some real cliches but there are some things that are you know different types of winds or whatever so just a gust of wind that could come right. by, you know and um and so it's like I always tell them that the hardest thing for me was always thinking because the plot point didn't have a sound because it might be somebody realizes something somebody you know somebody feels something and it doesn't have a doesn't have a um a sound but that's your responsibility so is there something metaphorically you can do with an off-screen effect and those are the most important and then i tell them really like you know i heard this great composer 
but he was at U USC C anyway. He came and he gave a lecture when he was really old. But he said, you know, the most important thing for music is because they'll overly or they won't know how to talk with the composer. But it's the, it's more important than the style of the music, than the instrumentation, than anything is where are the in points and where are the out points? Meaning, where does the director want it to and why start the music to start? But where does it stop? Because you can't just fade out music, you know, because when we do these short films, a composer can do that in no time at all, five minutes all the way through. And it's that, oh, God, there's nothing worse than where it's like they don't have enough confidence in their own movie. And you got elevator music going through a scene. It's like, what the hell is that? You know, right. <laughs> and so it's really fun to talk to them about that, too, because and they might not know, understand that. But, you know, so those are just like some real basics of are you getting and, are you getting more ma male or female students now? Oh, my God, it's great. I mean, I get both and it's like I love to see um yeah I mean we're like 50 50 I think Excellent. um yeah it's really I noticed that more of the um applicants for the at least in the panel that I was looking at we had more females applying for the sound division this year that wasn't true last year this year for the um internships there were more females and a lot of them were um a, a lot of different nationalities too which is really great you know, Vanessa, after I, the first time I showed Making Waves when it was um, finished, I showed it at USC for a film thing, and it still makes me cry when I think about it. Um, it was it was the um, African-American women came up to me with tears in their eyes, crying, hugging me. And it was all because Bobby Banks, you know, right. and, uh, uh, and Greg were in the movie. Right. And it was, oh, my God. And I think, you know, having Eileen Lee and stuff and... Um, you got to see yourself. And I think it's made a huge difference. Um, yeah. And so it was put these people in to see because, but I'll tell you, you go to see, still go to CAS, MPSC, all this, who is up on the stage all the time. It's changed. It is changing. And we're working hard at the Academy to really get it to change, but there's pushback on those, you know, there could be pushback. We're going to have to die off before they it really gets to, but you know what? All the guys that I worked with said like um, Hudson Miller, for example, would say, you know, the more that our crew would look like the world, like, you know, all different types of people and everything else, the be the more humane and the better it was. Cause yeah. you know, one of those mixed stages where it was all guys and somebody inevitably is going through a divorce because they're on those mixed stages. So well, all the time. Right. And then there's like talking badly about CC Hall tells a, what, a craziest story about that. But um, where Juno Ellis wouldn't come to work one day because um, she couldn't take the language that they were using. And then when she confronted the guys, they were like, oh, we love Juno, you know, and it was all they had no idea that they how they were speaking. It changed a lot. I, you know, we've been around long enough to know how much things have changed because, you know, I started in 1980. Things have changed a lot. <laughs> it's changed. Well, this has been wonderful. We'll have to talk some more another time. There's just so much to cover. All right, great. It was great to talk to you. <laughs>